we are going to continue uh, our look uh, at the book of Daniel. And we'll get to our text in, in, in just a few moments. We heard this passage of scripture last week, but we're going to hear a portion of it once again this week because I just didn't feel like we were able to get through as much as I would have liked to last week. Um, and um, so, so we're going to pick up uh, verse 20 of chapter 9. But, but uh, here's the thing. Last week we, 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 we talked about Daniel's prayer, which is really what the first uh, 19 verses were all about. Daniel praying, Daniel praising God, Daniel um, uh, asking for forgiveness, confessing his sin, and then seeking God's grace and, and restoration for not only him, but for all God's people. And so, so that's kind of what took place in the first 19 verses. But, but, but now we come to the final verses. And, and it made me think how every year, and I, I don't know if, if you pay much attention to this, but, but every year, other than the first year of a new presidential administration, the president of the United States, he addresses the American citizens, as well as a joint session of Congress, and, and that address is known as the State of the Union Address. And it is in this address the President will report on the condition of the nation, but also he will lay out his agenda uh, for, for the coming year. And, and, and you know, regardless of, of the party that's, that's in power, the President, I, I tend to like to at least catch parts of this because it's interesting to know where we're going from here as a nation, um, you know, uh, and beyond that, I, I generally find it as good fictional entertainment, um, you know, fiction, uh, describing imaginary events and imaginary people, um, but, but what I find even more entertaining is what follows the address, and this, again, it doesn't matter what party is in, 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 in charge here. Um, what, what usually follows, uh, or what always follows, is a response from the other side. Right? You all, you all stay tuned for that when you go to bed as soon as they say it. You know, the response, you get to hear from the other side. And you have this representative from the opposing party who will respond to what the president has just said. And mind you, they write their response before they even hear what, what the president is, is about to say, causing me to wonder, you know, how do they do that? It must be omniscient, right? That's what I think until I listen to their words. Then I don't think they're so omniscient, I just think they're partisan. But uh, regardless, that's sort of what I thought of when, when I came to this passage of scripture in the book of Daniel. Daniel is not even done praying. He, and suddenly this angel, Gabriel, appears with a message from God, causing me to think he must be omniscient. And guess what? He is omniscient. Our God is omniscient. He knows everything. So this morning, we will hear his response from the other side concerning Daniel's prayer. So let's now listen to Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Are you on me? While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Anointed One, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the Anointed One will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. 
the Lord add his blessing to the hearing of his holy word. Here's the thing. We do not know how long Daniel has been praying. And the scripture does not tell us that because it doesn't tell us when he began to pray. Could have been first thing out of bed that morning. We don't know how long he has been praying, but we, uh, um, we do know when he ends, right? The text tells us when, when it comes. We, we know that he is still praying when it's time for the evening burnt offering, which was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon from Jewish tradition. That's when it would take place. Um, and, and it caused me to immediately think, well, you know, uh, Daniel may be living in Babylon. I've uh, been there now for about 66 years, as we've uh, detailed already, but he still measures time based on Jewish religious practices. Verse 21 tells us, Daniel writes, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in a swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Wow, you see, although he's in Babylon, Daniel was in Babylon, but his heart is still in Jerusalem. His heart is still in, in Jerusalem uh, with his with his uh, people, and it causes me sometimes to think, you know, our bodies are here, right here in Monrovia, here in the United States, but where are our hearts? You know, do we measure time based on 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 worldly things, or do we measure it based on on, on godly things? And, and and so I began to ponder that, but 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 regardless, we understand this. Daniel had been praying. For hours. He had been pouring out his praises. He had been grieving over his sins. That's what the Bible tells us. He had been seeking God's grace when all of a sudden Gabriel, Gabriel comes in. He interrupts his prayer and he begins to speak to him. And, and, and I'm thinking to myself that sometimes you and I, we wonder, anybody, maybe just be me, we wonder whether anybody out there is listening. Sometimes we think that. Sometimes we wonder to ourselves, if not out loud, are you paying attention to God? Are you paying attention to me? Can you see what I am going through right now? Can you see because I'm hurting, I'm struggling? Uh, can you hear me now? And, and, and I think sometimes we as humans, we sometimes fall prey to that sort of mindset. And, and, and trust me, just as God heard Daniel's prayer, just as he responds to it, God hears our cries. When we cry out, he hears and he responds. <clears throat> and for Daniel, this is no partisan response to a State of the Union address. Uh, it might include an agenda for the future, but it's not a partisan address here. This is a divine response from heaven above, given before Daniel has even finished his prayer, uh, which, which might, uh, for some of us, indicate that we don't pray long enough. You know? Uh, but 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 uh, regardless, here's the thing: God God is is valuing this broken vessel. Daniel has repented. Daniel has sought God's grace, and God has immediately responded. He heard and responds, sending his messenger, the angel Gabriel, to speak on his behalf. Now, uh, Daniel, you you may recall. We talked about this last week. He's praying about the restoration of his people to the promised land. Remember, they've been in exile. It has been said and prophesied way in advance that they'd be there for 70 years. He's praying about their restoration to the land that God had promised them. But as he soon finds out, God has something much bigger in mind here than just the restoration to the promised land. Uh, while, while, while you and I, we sometimes question God. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we, we, we question his answering to our prayers. But I, but, but I think this passage of Scripture serves to remind us that, that, that we ought to, not to ever dismiss that oftentimes God gives us so much more than we're asking. Gives us so much because he knows what we need and he gives us what we need. He gives us more than what we're asking for. You see, Daniel, he didn't even realize it. But he is standing at a critical time in the crossroads of the history of Israel. And Israel has been in captivity for 70 years. And that's about to come to an end. But God, God is mapping out another block in the history of Israel. Um, and interestingly enough, 70, the number 70, it comes into play once again as he does this. For we see in verse number 24, Gabriel reveals this new timeline that moves beyond just the restoration 
to Jerusalem. He says, 77s are decreed for your holy people and your holy city. 77s. Now, the Hebrew word here used for, for seventh, it can also be translated as weeks. So some people will say, well, you, you, you may read some translations, 70 weeks. Uh, however, the word literally means seven or units of seven. Okay? And with that in mind, we look at the context of Daniel's prayer, right? And, and Daniel is praying about years of captivity, not weeks. And, and so it is accepted by virtually all theologians that Gabriel here is referring to seven periods of, of uh, seven-year units. Okay, so, so, so if you talk about seven times uh, 70, you're now talking about 490 years. That, that's what we're talking about. 400, that's, a, that's what, I, I didn't do the math myself, but, but, but that's what they say, uh, 490 years. So, so we've got this timeline that is going to take place for 490 years into the future. Uh, and Gabriel not only gives a timeline, but it begins to lay out in this passage of scripture what God is gonna accomplish during those 490 years. He's gonna finish the transgression. Verse number 24 says, he will make an end of sin. He will make an atonement for wickedness. He will bring in everlasting righteousness. He will seal up vision and prophecy, and he will anoint the most holy place. It lays out in, in, in detail here, you might say, the six things. And of course, God accomplished much more than six things over those 490 years. But these six promises, if you will, that he gives to Daniel and he gives to his people. <coughs> and think about that for a minute. I mean, are, are you taking that all in? You know, in God's grace, he answers Daniel's prayer. Daniel's prayer was a prayer of seeking forgiveness and a return to, to their homeland. That's really what Daniel was praying. But, but God says, that's just the beginning. Not only will I bring that about, but I'm going to do so much more. I've got a lot more in mind. And, and, and that's just who God is. He is amazing in that way. Uh, he is providing more than we could ever hope for or we could ever ask for on our own. Daniel, he asked for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness and return to the homeland. But God gives three promises, his first three promises, to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin and atonement for iniquity. God, God, uh, God, God uh, makes those promises. Uh, he offers a, a permanent pardon for sin. Daniel was asking for, for temporary forgiveness. He was asking for forgiveness. But, but God offers permanent. In those first three, God offers permanent pardon for sin. And then in the next three promises, God offers a lasting home. Not just return to the homeland, but an eternal home in the last three promises is what God is, is telling Daniel lies ahead for the people of Israel, for his people. You know, the, the first three promises, they have already been fulfilled, right? When we talk about this pardon for sin, we know that in Jesus Christ, those have already been fulfilled. And the final three will be fulfilled when he comes back. And trust me, he's coming back. So, so that's what he is laying out in, the, in these verses. That's what God is telling us about the future, the future of Israel, the future for us in the world today. And, and then Gabriel, on behalf of God, actually breaks those, the, the, that 490 years into three sections. He's going to give them more detail. Isn't that wonderful how God gives us this detail? Once again, proving how credible he is as everything he says is about to take place. And the first block, the first section, is going to be uh, seven seven-year spans. And that would be 49 years. Um, uh, I got that math down. Seven times seven, 49 years. And, and this is the frame in which Gabriel tells us and tells Daniel specifically in which the Jewish people are going to return to Jerusalem and will totally rebuild the holy city. We, we, we looked at this in great detail last spring when we studied the uh, book of Nehemiah as they were rebuilding the wall and, and, and putting worship back into place in Jerusalem. So that's the first part. 49 years. 49 years they will return and rebuild completely the city of Jerusalem. Which, by the, by the way, happens exactly in 49 years. Uh, but then we have the second block of time. And it's going to last a little longer. 
Gabriel says. That second block is going to last for 62 seven-year spans. And that math's a little harder for me, so, so I had to get on my calculator. That's 434 years. 400, the second period is 434 years. And, and, and Gabriel says it will culminate in the appearance of the anointed one. It will culminate with the appearance of the Messiah, the Prince. Now let me share with you, because I came across this, you know, when I'm studying and I'm, I'm preparing, I come across interesting uh, facts and, and, and something pretty incredible I, I came across uh, as I was doing the preparation for this week's message. If we begin counting on the first day of the Jewish month of Nisan, which is in March or April, um, you begin counting on the first day of Nisan in the year 444 BC, and that's the, the, the day that Anna Erxes, the, the, the king, hands over the letters, which clears the way for Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. And then you add 49 years, that's again the period, uh, the first block of years, and then you add another 434 years, that's the second block of years. You come up with 483 years. Now I want you to stay with me here for just a minute. I thought about my probably should put it in the back here so you could actually follow the math, um, and, which I did not do. I'm following somebody else's math here. But, but, but uh, using a Jewish calendar, which is based on a 360-day lunar year, that would be the equivalent of uh, 173,880 days. That's what it comes to, those 483 years. It comes to 173,880 days. Now, a scholar by the name of Harold Honer, he has determined that if you count forward, 173,880 days from the first day of Nisan, year 444 BC, that year that Antiochus gave the decree to go back to Jerusalem, and you arrive at the 10th day of Nisan, 33 AD. That is believed to be the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and proclaimed to the world that he was the anointed one, that he was the Messiah. And that's pretty amazing stuff, right? That's pretty amazing stuff. 500 years before that first Palm Sunday, God sent out a save the date note to the people of Israel. Save the date, if you will. New arrival, my son, the Messiah. It's incredible when you look at the detail that God gives us. Uh, and, not, and not everybody is in total agreement about those precise dates. And, you know, it's in that first Palm Sunday, but everyone, everyone is in agreement that, that uh, the 483 years will would have certainly come to an end during the ministry of Jesus Christ. The anointed one that Gabriel speaks of in verse number 25. So, that's, that, that to me is just mind-boggling. You know, that God gives us such detail in, in, in his telling us the future. But, Dan, but Gabriel doesn't stop there. He does not stop. He goes on to tell Daniel that the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus, he will be cut off. He prophesies, uh, you know, uh, in advance. He prophesies the atoning sacrifice that Jesus is about to make some 490 years in the future. Um, or, or, or about that. So, so Gabriel tells Daniel, he says, this king, this king, this anointed one who will, 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 uh, will, will, will rise, he will not be permitted to rule. He will not be, for, for, for his people cried out. Gabriel says his people can now maybe you might recall a certain Jewish crowd that gathered in Jerusalem on a Friday and cried out before Pilate crucify him we have no king but Caesar you, you might recall that the people did cry out here's God telling us in advance people are going to cry out Luke 19 14 we hear the crowd proclaim we will not have this man rule over us it's writing God's word and God proclaimed this hundreds of years in advance. Gabriel is laying out Israel's history to them and for all to see. And then he speaks of coming judgment. Coming judgment for what has happened. Um, you, you see, God has judged his people before. You may recall there was a flood at one time that wiped out all of humanity, unless uh, Noah and his family. But he says judgment is coming. It's coming once again like a flood, but not a flood. Gabriel speaks of the pending judgment that is about to come upon God's people at the hands of the Romans. They will annihilate Jerusalem. 
Basically, that's what, what he is forecasting here in advance. They're going to annihilate uh, Jerusalem. Jesus talks about this himself. We read his words concerning this as, as in Luke 21 where it says, As for what you see, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. The Romans, they are the people. They are the people of, of, of the prince that shall come, the Gabriel speaks of. And they came. Trust me, they came. And, and their army strolled into Jerusalem. Uh, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. And the Jewish people were scattered. And that's what happened. And, you know, that's what happens. Now, that prince, which is known as Rome, also has a double meaning. For even as Gabriel speaks of the prince, meaning Rome, he is also speaking uh, of, of the Antichrist. And, and so we see this prince this Antichrist stepping into history. Now, week 69, okay? August really leads to week 70. And, 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 and here's the thing. Um, we're still waiting for week number 70. Week 70 has not yet taken place. I'm pretty sure that Daniel had no idea that there'd be such a gap between the second and third block of time. That, that God was telling him about. Um, I mean, that's just, this is what you might call a really long weekend, okay, between weeks. But, but the final chapter of Israel's history is, is one seven-week uh, block of time, uh, or seven-year block of time, if you say, you know, seven times one. Uh, and so Gabriel speaks of this in verse number 27. He says, the coming prince, now this coming prince is a reference to the Antichrist. Um, he says, you will see that the, the, this seven year period, which is in our future somewhere, this seven year, it will begin by the signing of a peace agreement, a covenant between the Antichrist and the Jewish people. Part of their history, is part of our future. He says, there'll be a peace agreement that'll be signed. There'll be a covenant between an the Antichrist and the Jewish people. Um, I mean, you talk about details, right? Here's what God is doing. He talked about details. Uh, this agreement that the Jewish people will enter into with the Antichrist, it will restore once again worship in the temple in Jerusalem. It will restore worship in a restored temple uh, in God's holy city. And, but, but, but here's the thing. After three and a half years, the text tells us, after three and a half years, the, the Antichrist can show his true colors. After three and a half years, he's going to renege on the covenant. Uh, the sacrifices, the worship that were, will, will be taking place will come to an abrupt end. And he, meaning the Antichrist, will set up an abominable, abominable religious system in which he becomes the focus of the worship. Okay? And that's, a, that's a quite a tough thing, right? In the future. We're still waiting for that. That's in the future. Um, but, but here's the thing. God does not leave us hanging. God does not leave us hanging. When all seems lost, Gabriel tells Daniel, the anointed one, the true prince, not the false prince, the true prince, Christ himself, will return. And he will crush the false prince and all of his followers. And he will set up his kingdom. And his kingdom will last forever, a kingdom of everlasting righteousness. This is what... This is what God tells Daniel as a response to his prayer. This is what God tells him. I mean, there you have it. What a timeline. What details that God gives us. And I know, I hope I didn't bore you here. I know I'm more teaching maybe than preaching today. But, but I think it's important that we understand. This is what God is telling us about our future. You know, God's had 49 years. And Jerusalem will be restored. 490 years to sin his son to defeat sin once and for all. And then a pause. There'll be a pause. How long is that pause? Well, nobody knows exactly. That's where we are today. We are on pause, if you will. We are in this period which is known as the church age. But make no mistake about it, there's going to be a week seven. There's going to be a final seven year span of time. It's not a matter of if. It's simply a matter of and so for you and I, the question always comes back to you. You've got to be ready, right? If you know it's coming, 
He could come back at any time. The Bible tells us trumpet can sound. He can return. You got to be ready for his return. You know, God gave Daniel a look into the future. But when he gave Daniel that look into the future, he gave it to you and I too. Um, and everything that God said would happen in those 483 years, less, or the 490 less seven, um, it's all happened just as God proclaimed that it was going to happen. The news media would say he is a credible source, God is, because everything he says comes true. So we need to be ready. Wouldn't you say? You need to be ready. And you ask how am I ready? What are you ready if you turn to Jesus? Then you're ready. If you trusted in Jesus, if you asked him to come into your life, said, I believe in you, Jesus. My God has proclaimed you're coming. You came. You died. I believe you're God's one and only son. I believe in you. Come into my life. If you've done that, then you're ready. If you've turned your life, if you've surrendered to Jesus, you're ready. And I hope and pray you're all ready. Because God is telling you it's coming. And it can come at any moment. It can come at any time. But even if you're ready, the question always arises, what about the people around you? What about the people you know? Your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. Are they ready? And what can you do to help them get ready? It's coming. We need to be able to share the story of our Savior with the people around us because God has foretold us this is going to happen. For the people you love, are they ready? You need to share with them about God's amazing love, about God's amazing grace, about how this Jesus, this Messiah, the anointed one, has changed your life. Tell them your story, how he came into your life and changed it forever so that they too can believe in Jesus and be ready when he returns. Because it can happen at any moment. It will happen at some moment in time. And so we not only need to be ready, but we need to make sure the people around us are ready, that they believe and trust in Jesus. And as I conclude today's message, again, I remind you, we need to always, always remember uh, that God has done more than just prove in this, in this passage that he's a credible source. He has made it clear that he is always listening. He has made it so clear that he is always listening. Don't think for one moment when you turn to him in prayer that he's not interested because he is interested. Don't think that he has too much on his plate, that he is too busy today to respond to you because he's always ready to respond to you. He's never too busy. He loves us. And in the end, he will respond to us. He loves us. And while he may not give us exactly what we ask for, he has something even better than that. That's, to me, the true message. God has something better in mind, whatever you are asking for. And, and, and you may not, you know, it may not always take place in the here and now. But, but it may take place in the here and now. But it may take place in eternity. But God has plans for you. He has plans for you. How did he put it to Jeremiah? He has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. This message ought to give you hope. Because that's what it is. It's a look into a crystal ball. A look into the future. And we know for a fact that it is true. That's his promise. That's his response from the other side of your prayers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. You are so awesome. You know the future because the future is in your hands. And you, you not only know it, but you make plans for us to prosper. 
you give us hope when things seem hopeless. Because you not only know the future, but you control it. You not only know what we ask for, but you know what's best for us. And you give us so much more than we ask for or deserve. And so we praise your holy name. And we pray that we can focus on you and on your agenda. And begin to let our agendas fade away. Because in the end, it's about you. And we do pray, Lord God, that you would lead us, guide us, equip us to share this good news with the people around us, that they too might be ready. We pray this in Jesus.